Welcome everybody to our Cafe Edmonton event, Canadian Association for Equality. We're a federally, federally recognized charity with various branches across Canada, and we're very interested in marginalized gender issues, especially those affecting men and boys. And so, <clears throat> just a couple housekeeping items. We have a, a big event coming up in January, January 29th. We're sponsoring a, a screening of Cassie J's Red Pill in Grand Prairie. Um, it's going to be a Grand Prairie Live Theatre project and it's going to be at 7 o'clock and we're really looking forward to getting out into different areas of Alberta and um, raising awareness of some of the issues in the film and those that we advocate for at CAFE. So I'd like to introduce you to Dean. He's going to be talking about, Dean Harvey from Nunavut, he's going to be talking about some of his work um, with boys. Um, at CAFE we talk about men quite a bit, um, of age men. So these are some issues that need to be addressed. Without further ado, I'll introduce Dean Harvey. I'd like to talk probably for the first hour. I'd like to explain some of the um, a bit of the theory and the ideas that I think are affecting boys especially, um, but a lot of this applies to girls too. Um, like my name is Dean Harvey. Uh, I actually live in Northwest Territories now, uh, but I've also lived in Nunavut, gained a lot of experience up there. I've been living in the North since 1998, and uh, I'm a family therapist. I work now as uh, an educator, and um, I'll I'll be glancing at my notes to see if I can kind of keep this as a, a bit of a story, but also include the theories about um, where I think we've gone off track in the modern world, and then how it is that we, and I will get at the end of the problems, um, where we can go with, where to stick the lever in, how to help the boys mature, uh, and girls, and uh, see what we can do to turn things around a bit. So, a couple of things. I'm going to say some things that will, um, for me, are uh, key points. So the first one is, uh, for tens of thousands of years, we have been raising our children in a hierarchy of relationships. Boys and girls would be part of groups, play groups, learning groups that would be have kids who are older and kids who are younger at the same time. And for the kids that are older, you were supposed to listen to them and do what they told you to do. Um, for the kids that are younger, you were charged with, well, look after your little sister, or brother, or cousin. And with, in the past, when we had larger families, we had a lot of sibling groups that also supported this kind of learning. So, in the last hundred years, we have started to put children into the same age categories. Starting kindergarten, grade one, two, all the way up to grade 12. We isolate them in same age peer groups. Families have started getting smaller, so they don't have the siblings. And now these children are growing up really only knowing kids the same age. Now, that, you know, by itself, wouldn't be too much of a problem for the last 100 years. We've had lots of things to compensate for it. But we have slowly taken away all the, the mitigating factors, and now we're left with just, oh, now all the consequences are coming on to, to affect the boys and girls, but the boys mostly, uh, and affect them badly. So, that's number one. We need to find a way to connect the kids to other kids and to adults outside their own age group. Their attachment, their attachment in those relationships to siblings, to other kids, those that, and to their parents, those, that attachment, that's a need for a child to get met. It's not just a, a desirable thing, it's actually a need. So the second thing I would say is that being in the right relationship with a, like a primary caregiver um, 
that's a necessary prerequisite to learning. Without being in the right relationship to the caregiver, um, it's, it's as though the social brain tells the, once they're, you're in the correct relationship with mom and dad, then the social brain tells the learning brain to turn on. But the right relationship has to be present first. And we have probably got that wrong over the last little while because the focus has been in child development, mostly on something called learning theory, which said if you just break things into small enough pieces and go slow enough, you can teach anything to anybody. We found that, well, that's not quite true. So now we know the prerequisite is that relationship is the prerequisite. The attachment needs have to be met. We have kids who will go around now, just to bring it back to what you might recognize. We have kids going around now who generally don't have their attachment needs met. We have many kids, if not most, who are having trouble getting their attachment needs met. This is in the poor social um, economic families, you will find that they're more likely not to get their attachment needs met. There's less time, less resources, less opportunities, and so we're more likely to not get their attachment needs met. When the attachment needs aren't met, and they're going around with a kind of attachment deficit, these children will lack, now if you're talking little kids, under six, they will tend to be appearing to be unmotivated. Their emergent energy, the stuff that naturally is supposed to come out of a human and make us curious and creative and playful and want to learn, that emergent energy start just shuts down. So in order to get that energy to come out of the child, you need the attachment needs. When the children are older, um, school age, then they will say, I'm bored. I'm not bored. And despite the fact that they're in rooms full of toys, in fact they can't get from the door to their bed without kicking toys out of the way, they've never had more to do. Electronics and 500 channel TV universes, game systems, smartphones. They've never had more to do. Recreational centers, sports programs, you name it, and they will sit there and say, I'm bored. And we, as a society, every time misinterpret that, and you will hear a call go out, we need more for our, our youth to do. You know, our youth don't have enough to do. We need to create more activities for them. And then it misses the mark. It doesn't solve the problem. So we keep pushing more and more, but it doesn't solve the problem. The problem is, the child has this empty feeling in them, they look around, but they know that none of these activities are going to satisfy. And they don't know how to interpret that empty feeling, that missing attachment deficit. And so they come up with the word, I'm bored. And we as adults are misinterpreting that one. You know, saying what they need is a hug. <laughs> they need to get back <laughs> into the right relationship with their primary caregiver. So, you know when you've seen uh, a mother holding a, a child at the age they can still be held and not too heavy. <laughs> and uh, you approach them, that child will see you and then I'm not sure if you're this is a good thing that you're approaching, a bad thing, who are you? And they will turn and look at mom's face and take a compass read, or dad's face if dad's holding them, and take a compass read on dad's face. Is this a, and then dad's smiling? Yeah, okay, well, what was this? I'm curious, right? So they take they use their primary caregiver their attachment needs to take a, a compass read. I was probably about mm, 10 years ago. I approached four kids in junior high school leaning against the school wall and at the time I was recruiting for, um, I was volunteering and teaching judo and I was recruiting and I saw three girls and a boy and the boy looked pretty athletic and I thought I'm walking by, so I stopped and I said, hey, you look pretty athletic. You know, I don't know if you know this, but I teach judo up in the rec center, the top floor, on Saturday mornings. You're probably pretty good at judo. You want to give it a try? It's free. And 
I'm not kidding you. He did. Took a compass read on those two girls, a compass read on this one, and they all went. And he went. <laughs> and that was it. He never showed up. And I realized this boy is attached to his peers. He used his peers as a compass. He needed to stick with his group. So this boy was already junior high school boy, peer oriented. Rather than being oriented to the primary caregiver and have a proper attachment need, he is peer oriented. Now, I'm used to see this as happening in that transition where they go from grade six to seven, and in grade seven they become peer oriented, but I'm now seeing in grade six and grade five they're becoming peer oriented. So, it's more challenging. Um, so what we need to do is find a way to stay attached to these kids. I think we have been tricked by media to think that the goal of parenting was to create independence in the child. That assuming you got the child to do more things themselves without your help, that was a good thing. You can tie your shoes by yourself, great. Um, you can go to the bathroom and do the pull up and pull down things, your technology pull ups, right? And what did that do? Well, it meant mom didn't need to assist or dad didn't need to assist in helping the kid with the bathroom chores. Well, okay, but the downside is now you don't have mom and dad helping with the bathroom chores and interacting and learning together and doing things and having that, that contact. That's the downside. So I think we've been tricked into thinking that independence was the goal of parenting. Now ultimately the child will grow up, emancipate, become an independent adult. My suggestion is that the parent's role is to provide the attachment needs, make sure those attachment needs are satisfied. When the child doesn't need you anymore, you will be dismissed. They will run off and do their own thing. In fact, if their attachment needs are met, that's when ch children are willing to step out, use their creativity, explore, play, be creative, and learn. Because the attachment needs have been met. If you would like to see where early, that early theory <coughs> uh, comes from a um, psychologist named Bowlby, and if you go to in the internet, and look up a thing called The Strange Situation. There's an experiment they do with two and three year olds where they get mom to bring the child into a room and then mom does this little experiment where she leaves the room and the experimenter and the video camera is behind some glass. And then have mom come back, right, and um, see what the kid's response is to mom having left and then coming back. And different kids will have different responses. And based on the kind of response that kids demonstrate, we can assign that kid one of four different kinds of attachment styles. So kids will attach in different ways, and not all siblings will attach the same way. There's names for the different attachment styles, but funnily enough, and just I guess part of the answer to the side, whatever the attachment style is identified as a, for a child, forward the camera, 20 years, find out how that person attaches to their romantic partners, and it will be the same attachment style. And if you want to take your attachment style online, just Google attachment style self-test inventory, and you can find out your own attachment style, and then see if that plays out with how you, you know, believe it, and see how it goes. So attachment styles. This would be part of child development theory that never really got going until the 21st century. Um, the best proponent of it right now is a man named um, Dr. Gordon Neufeld. Anybody heard of that one? Okay, he's a UBC professor in child development, and he has his, he left UBC. Um, he was a consultant with our organization when I worked in BC and uh, got to know his stuff before he left UBC. And now he has his own institute you know, under his own name, Gordon Rufell. Anybody wants the names afterwards, I'll write them down for you. He's got a tremendous website with tons of resources, videotapes, courses, all sorts of things that you can take.
based on this uh, attachment business. What kids need and how to, uh, what kids need and how to provide it. Okay, I'll just check my notes to see where I am in the story. Okay, so mother's role and father's role. In the last while, we've been um, in the last while we've been mostly saying that mothers are maybe better at the nurturing. Well, maybe they aren't. Uh, nurturing is really important, and it came with those kinds of um, cliche sayings like "all you need is love." Well, it's not all you need is love. If the only thing you're providing a child is love, you end up with spoiled children. So part of the learning process for any child to mature them is, is that they need to have limits. They need to hear no and not get what they want. And then, what do they do? Well, they get frustrated. And they have to get to the point of that frustration. Okay, they could have a tantrum play that out, let the kid have the tantrum. That doesn't get them what they want, now they have to adapt. And the child realizes they're never gonna get what they want. And so that Gordon Fail would describe as the tears of futility. The child realizes they're never gonna get that cookie before supper. And all you can really do is comfort the child and say, you know, I know, you really wanted that cookie, didn't you? Oh, I did, I did, I did. Oh, you wanted it more than anything, didn't you? Oh, I did, I did, I did. And the child goes through the tears of utility, but they find out they don't die. Right? And then the child learns to um, put off their immediate gratification. They can learn to live without. And that's the baby steps of the maturing process that goes on. I think many times in the early days, 70s, 80s, when we had a lot more single parents become single parents, divorce rates were rising, I think many of the mothers perhaps maybe even felt guilty and perhaps wanted to give more to their kids and didn't want to say no. Dads went around. It was a difficult time for them. So I think that the role that has been played out in evolution over a long period of time has been that in many ways fathers would have played more of a role of limit setter. And we thought that even in our popular media, media when you watch TV families and like, just wait till your father comes home. Right? So mom's nurturing them all day, but there was this role that we expected from fathers to come home and set limits. And somehow we've we've lost that. Well we kind of had the rise of fatherlessness and I'm gonna get to a lot of those factors. But that was not being done either. And so we're, our kids aren't getting that maturation process. And so they are not mature. And I, I'm not sure that you know, each generation is apparently supposed to be getting smarter with how much they learn. But I'm not sure the maturation is improving. I, in fact, some of the stuff I've seen with our best and brightest educated kids on you know, Ivory Tower. Universities is showing that there's a lot of maturity still going on. Really full fledged genius level kids in safe spaces. <laughs> like, man, I never even heard of that when I went to university. <laughs> safe spaces. Okay. Um, so that's maturation. Covered pure orientation. Okay, so, well, not all the peer orientation. So children are not getting the attachment needs met, and the only people they can turn to is the child um, gets into daycare right away. Of course, mom has to go back to work because we're telling mothers that they need to work too. It's how they maintain that. It's how we've been able to maintain the productivity. Most of the productivity increases over the last 30 years is because we've increased the participation of the workforce, not because we're actually more efficient at work. <coughs> so now we have both parents working. Um, we need to get children into government care right away, and so they start attending daycare. 
and it sorted out by age again. So we put kids into school based on date of manufacture. <laughs> so if you're a 1988 kid, then in schools you go at a certain age, right? And um, you go through the school system, and everybody in your class is the same age as you, give or take six months or something, right? Maybe there's a kid that failed a year or skipped a year, but it's all same age peers. By the time they get to about grade five, you know, they might have had a good year with one teacher, and that was a good year, they learned away. But then it's what the school swaps out the teachers on. And then the next year they're back with the same kids but new teacher. And then the same kids but new teacher. And by the time they get to grade five, they realize the only constant people in their lives are their peers. So now, who do you think where they're going to go turn to for attachment? All their peers. So they try to get their their attachment needs met from peers who don't owe them anything. And your BFF today might not be your BFF tomorrow. So you better keep track of this. And this makes them very anxious because these are your needs we're talking about, right? Like, it's up there with food and clothing and shelter. And now you're trying to get your attachment needs met. Like, how do you belong as a social animal with the world around you? Well, you have to be attached. And so you attach to your peers. But they're fickle. They can turn on you in an instant. They, things happen, right? trauma. And so the kids become, out of this anxiety, they become hypervigilant to monitor the social interactions in their peer group. And we've done them a disservice by turning over this high-powered technology that allows them to stay in constant contact with their peers. And of course, they become hypervigilant, monitoring their peer interactions. Um, I mean, when I was a kid and we came back from holidays, not having any contact with, you know, no, you're not going long distance, it's, it's costing much. <laughs> so, two weeks of being away, I was supposed to be the first one to grab the phone to phone our friends, right? Well, okay, we're not really peer oriented, but we still wanted that contact with our friends, right? But now, it's constant contact. And in the north, if we try to take kids out into the bush and tell them they gotta leave their cell phones behind, they go through about the first 24 to 48 hours in a kind of a depression when they realize they can call their friends and stay in touch. And it takes them a while to kind of come out of that and realize, well, there is things to do in the bush and activities that engage them and people to talk to and, and their relations to start. This is trouble. Uh, the second bad thing about the technology is that for the boys, the general problem is too much screen time. They're just playing too many games. And it's not that the games are necessarily bad. There's certain skills that you get out of it. The problem is it's displacing that time. is now displacing social time that they would have learned to read people's faces, um, identify expressions, um, be able to learn to interact, negotiate, um, go from tradesies to altruism. Um, these kinds of social interactions we now have. Well, according to Jane Donegal, in her TED Talk, uh, the average 21-year-old boy has spent 10,000 hours um, playing video games before the age of 21, which is about the same amount of time that he'd spend in uh, grade school if he had perfect attendance. <laughs> so that is a lot of time, and it's displaced what should be social, human, and learning activities. They're not out with their friends playing, making trios in the woods, or sitting with their friends playing house in the basement. So their skill levels are dropping uh, with these things that they're not doing. With the girls, uh, I'll say it appears that the technology, because of the social media of Facebook and um, the tech, constant texting and the hypervigilance, is amplified the social, the social interaction that girls normally participate in. And that amplification is too intense. And it's stressing them out. And uh, it's just girls don't know how to say no to drama. So, 
but both affects them both, but in different ways. Um, so let's go over some of the what I think is. I think we've we've got to where we've got a perfect storm now coming to coming home, and I think all these factors together. Are, the problem is that all we used to have a lot of mitigating factors, um, but we don't anymore. Most of those have disappeared. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of factors that I think are some of them I've mentioned already, and um, we see where that gets us. So decreasing family family size. So the average is now one or no siblings. Either no or one sibling. Uh, rise of women in the workforce, so women become, we got more latchkey kids and more overburdened mothers. They don't have the time to dedicate to their kids and give them the time for interacting and learning the, for the youngest kids, language and um, interactive abilities. Um, rise of single parent families so that kids now have access to half their parents, half the time. Um, rise of fatherlessness, that's huge. Um, it's pretty clear that the same gender parent of a child is really important to that child. Girls need their mothers, boys need their fathers. Um, but at the same time, with, with respect to fatherlessness, girls need their fathers. It's not a stretch to imagine that if a girl has not received healthy male attention from her father, by the time she hits puberty, she will go looking for male attention in all the wrong ways. She would be desperate. We don't want girls to be desperate. We want them to be healthy enough to, to choose well. Um, the rise of the myth of independence that our children, that we think that are, we're trying to get our children to be more independent right away. Oh, my kids really just are. Yeah, I give them a key so they can look after themselves after school, right? Oh, yeah, I get my one kid to babysit the other one, so. Uh, no, 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 no. Independence was never the goal. Uh, the goal is supply the attachment so that they have enough, they feel attached. They will go out and explore and play. The emergent energy will rise. Kids will naturally learn. They don't have to tell them to learn. They just will. They should be with humans that know how to do this. Uh, but not if the attachment needs are met. The emergent energy shuts down as soon as the attachment needs are met. Um, decline of the use of rites of passage. We don't have, for girls, we still have a rite of passage to become mothers. So as soon as you become a mother, well, write a passage, grandma pats you on the back. Oh, you're a mom now. It doesn't work that way for boys. And because boys are now, well, the majority of single parents are female by far. Um, so boys are being raised by their mothers, and then there's no father present to tell them, you're a man now. I mean, mom can say this, you know, you're, well, you're my man. Yeah, she's got no credibility. <laughs> uh, as a boy, I can tell you, my mother is saying that to me. That oh, was nice to hear. Yeah. <laughs> that's not. That's not where it really hit my heart. My heart was to hear it when my dad was proud of. And I've seen that happen with the boys that I've helped. That when they've come more of age, like started working with them in primary school, the judo club came. Other things I've been doing. By the time they got to graduate grade 12, and I've stopped them in the street and say, "Look, I've <coughs> I've watched you grow up. I've seen you, right? I've had my eye on you, right?" And they got attached to me. I was I got under their skin, and now when I see them in the store, the little northern store, I run into them. Hey, Henry, how are you doing? Big tall Henry. He's now six foot two. I used to hold him upside down with his ankles in judo class. <laughs> and he's six foot two. And I, hey, Henry, how you doing? He's all shy. He won't talk to me. You're fine. <laughs> and it's really funny to see a six foot tall young man be shy. But it's because of my little skin thing. And there was a man who had his eye on him. And now he's telling him he's go up to him, tell him, I'm really proud of you. I saw you, you know, say what you needed to say when you graduated on the stage there. And you're a man. Oh, just like, wow. 
No one ever told me that, right? But we don't have a rate of passion. Being a dad isn't doing it. Yet, doing it. There's lots of guys, you know, men that I know that have gotten somebody pregnant. They don't have the social skills to stay together because they're too immature to, to do that. But uh, the young men need to write a passage and they need to hear it from men. And we have, I think there's been a, a decline in our trust of men with children, period. And I can't, when I first started working with the school, I had no way I could get past the office without being stopped. But I walked into that school with you know, a couple of women that, and they never got stopped, right? Like, huh, there's just this basic, until I earned my place there, they knew I was there to help, but I was part of the solution of the problem, and I was in. But um, we don't actually encourage them to be involved. We don't trust them. And there, there are some reasons not to trust them. I won't get into those stats right now. <laughs> uh, especially with non-biological fathers. Um, the numbers are just not too much, too high. Um, the other problem we have now is, if you were to take, and again, I'm, I'm seeing these things by having been in 20 something different communities in Newburgh and NWT, and they're all small. I mean, the biggest communities are up to like 1,800, 3,000 people, but you can see the whole community at once in the gym, right? So you see everybody from uh, the families that are you know, upper middle class, government jobs, all the way down to the ones on social assistance, all at once. And so you can see the ones that are doing badly as well as the ones that are doing well. Here in Edmonton, we would, it's, it's a bit more anonymous, and depending on what part of the city you're in, you may go for a long time only seeing you know, middle class people at malls and, and stuff and never run into parts of the city that are much more desperate. So when these young kids are coming up through school, the young girls are doing, you know, the girls are doing better than the boys back in the grade one all the way to graduate school, they're doing the boys. That's just, just a known fact. Um, the ones that are academically inclined are moving up through the system and then where I'm from, they move on to government jobs or private industry and uh, great, great employment, great benefits. The ones who are not academically inclined, well, they're having babies. And they're having babies with other non-academically inclined youth their age, so equally immature peers. And the relationships don't stay together, and so they're a young girl who's got a new baby, uh, may still be in her teens, but as soon as she's 18, 19, uh, she comes over and applies for her own social assistance outside of her mother. She gets first in line at housing because she has a kid, so she gets social housing and wraparound services. And, well, where's the guy? Well, there is no guy because the guy's role has been the same for thousands of years. You're supposed to be a provider. You provide food, clothing, and shelter for your family. But these boys don't have jobs. So how can you be a provider? You can't. So the relationship breaks apart. These girls then go into the social assistance, get wraparound services, and now they marry the government. And that's who provides the food, clothing, and shelter. They don't need the guy. In fact, either she's She's told he's a deadbeat, and he's unnecessary, and disposable. It's too bad. So we have huge numbers of boys who um, end up not being able to find gainful employment, not being able to find the system isn't working nicely. We don't have a place for everybody to fit in. And, um, so that, that's one of the So, I think I've covered most of the problems. Oh no, not the big problems. <laughs> More problems. Like I said, it's a perfect storm of uh, problems and they all seem to be pushing the same way, which is why I think we're in such a mess. Um, rise of same age education. So we isolate children in their own age group, eliminates contact with children of other ages. Uh, the rise of pure orientation instead of being orientation.
oriented to the people you depend on. We now, we now orient it to the people who are undependable, our peers, because they always stop. Um, the technology is making it worse. Um, Good. How to intervene? Where to stick to the degree? Okay. So, if we're going to stick the lever in, we have to do it to repair those attachments. The children aren't going to learn unless they are properly attached because attachments are prerequisite to learn. I tried to recruit kids to the juvenile club. I started with young adults, worked my way to the high school, put on demonstrations, invited them out, and nobody came. Can't pull the kids out of the peer group because they're cemented in there. It's, it's like pulling a kid out of the Alberta muskeg in rubber boots and it's just <laughs> right back in again. So you have to get it before they're stuck in the mud, that peer orientation. And I worked my way down until I hit the grade five, six class. And all of a sudden I had like 18 out of 25 kids show up at judo for just one class. And, um, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Apparently that's where the, they'll say yes, because they're still willing to attach. They haven't become pure to yet. So we need to attack at the primary school level. If you're waiting till the teens, it's too late. They're already behind it, right? And now you're, the same problem I had with all the time that I spent in social work, which was you're helping people who had already gotten into trouble and you're just trying to get them out. Whereas, wouldn't it be easier if we started working with them before they got into trouble? And then we wouldn't have to do all that heavy lifting of trying to get them out of trouble. We could just get them when they're still good and help them keep going. Staying on the, staying on the, on the light side. So, I think about primary age, uh, if you can. Um, and then the idea is, how does each of our interventions serve attachment? That's the lens to which we've got to put all of our needs. Now, the school, will, the school, the community will say we just need more activities. But the school has organized its activities into things that don't work. They run their sports programs in two-month slots. So they do soccer for two months. They do track and field for six weeks. They do basketball for two months. And each time they switch from sports to sport, they switch up as coaches. So we take the peer group for that age, put them in a sport, then if they go to all the practices for two months, they get to go on the bus trip to a special tournament. So we take the peer group, put them on a bus, fence them in with chaperones. We sleep them together, feed them together, they get to bring their cell phones, they do the tournament together, they come back on the bus, and all we've done for the whole weekend is cement the peer group. <coughs> Not helpful. So, what we need to do is connect adults to kids and kids to other age groups over the entire school year, September to June. So I run the judo club starting September, I go all the way to June. I run the game club, board game club. Electronic free zone goes starts in September, goes all the way to June. Who do they run into? The same people every week, me. Along with, I hire a couple of, uh, for the game club, I hire a couple of, uh, 18, 19 year old boys who like games, and I teach them how to interact with the kids to teach them new games, book games. And not just the Parker Brothers and the bad and stuff, but the, kind of the fancy game store stuff. And then as they evolve through the game club, eventually they morph into doing the advanced role playing games. And so I have two parts of a giant classroom, and I've got the littler kids, grade three or grade seven playing the younger games, or board games. And over on the other side of the room, they've got the high school kids playing advanced role-playing games. Occasionally, the grade six will go over and sit with the high school kids and watch them play. No, but they won't let you sit there. And so, you know, shut up. Why? Because he's interested in what the older kids are doing. Right? It's all social interaction. Uh, the group leader of the role-playing game is learning leadership skills. 
organization skills, right? The two um, uh, grade 12 graduates that I got hired are learning to be, for the first time for young men, is probably the first time they've ever provided human service jobs, actually serving people. They've all done construction work. They've all done working at the gas station or the convenience store. But they've never really been in a job where they're actually thinking about how to help a group of little kids learn the game, how to lead a group, how to, how to look after the place and be responsible for the keys, all that. So I train them, then they train the little kids. The little kids are in a group where we got grade three all the way to adults. Geeks, twenty-seven-year-old geek. Like, this is the only place in town where I can like play games. <laughs> so I'm here. Yeah, I know, it's just high school kids. But when you're in a small town, your choices are limited, and we're happy to have this wide range of family game night. And I literally found family literacy dollars, which used to be used to teach young mothers to read to their kids, into creating this game club that's. Uh, we're averaging about 28 kids a night, whereas we used to have like four or five mothers at a time that come to read your, learn how to read storybooks to your kids. And it was, it just wasn't meeting the needs. Not enough families. This is way more efficient. The judo club, same thing. You get the kids in there. I always had at least four years of our grade school. So the kids would get in contact. They only had one quarter of the class that was never seen in each grade. The other three quarters of the judo class would have been outside of their grade. And it's ranked. So competition is good for boys. It's one of the key motivators for boys. But um, the school system is kind of eliminating competition. We no longer post grades. We no longer have kids compete with one and one because why? <laughs> Darn. But for a boy, as long as the outcome is in doubt, they're in. Right? Yeah, I'll probably try. Yeah, and so it's a huge motivator for them. If you eliminate that, it makes harder to motivate boys in school. So with the judo club, it's ranked based on your belt. So if you know more stuff, you can say, yeah, sure. And you'll sit right down and totally accept that he's at the bottom of the totem pole. But that's his place, he knows where his place is. He doesn't mind, he'll work his way up. He's trying the, the little hierarchy that's in there. And so when I try to teach the kids, I can't teach them all individually, they all need to learn different things. So I will get the older kids to teach the younger kids. So when a young one comes up, white belt and says, how do I get another stripe on my belt? How do I get the next color belt. I said, well, do you see a kid here that has a color, color belt? Yeah. Well, why don't you ask him to teach you? So then they'll both come over and go, he said I'm supposed to teach, he wants me to teach him. I'm like, yeah. Do you think you could teach him? Yeah, I could teach him. Well, you gotta teach him this, 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 and this. You know all of that? Yeah, okay. So the next 15 minutes I watch them teach, half an hour. They work on it, and then they're gonna get a test for a little strike to do a piece of this. And the younger one will come up and say, okay, I'm ready to take my test. Yeah, yeah, just a second. And I call over the, the one that was teaching. I said, this is your student? Yeah. And you taught him? Yeah. Okay, you stand right there because I'm going to test your student. And then I'll turn it and I'll, I'll, work. I'll say, okay, now I want to see you do this, 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 and this. First this, show me. Okay, so he shows me and he goes through. Okay, and he's, did I pass? Just a second. Back to my teacher, right? Okay, so you taught him and he did everything good. That was a really good job teaching. Way to go. And I'll bow to him. Because he's first, right? This is the ranking, right? And he's just like, oh, <laughs> waiting for it, right? And then I finally go to him and I get the stripe out. I said, you did a really good job. Really good job teaching him. Really good. And I give him all his bow and everything and put a stripe on his belt. And the two of them are just beaming. Well, now the relationship between the two is it's hierarchical, but it's the right kind of hierarchy. It's 
the proper one. It's the one I sanction, right? And now he knows that this is the way it works to get up to the, the top. Boys love this. Are you allowed hierarchies in school? No. We're all the same. We're all special. <laughs> this philosophy doesn't work with boys. Boys don't get that. So boys will naturally want to work out a, a pecking order. Well, it's not only a pecking, it's a hierarchy. And so they will wrestle with each other until one can hold the other one down. No, I don't know let you up, right? I'm going to take some snow and put it on your face, right? And you're going to say, uncle? Uncle, uncle. Okay. Well, just as long as you know who's boss. Okay, so the boys work it out. And we call that bullying. And really what it was was just trying to figure out what the, the boy order is amongst the peer group. Because even if, I mean, there are kids that are not emotionally healthy who get a little out of control with that, and that requires intervening. I'm not advocating bullying. But boys have a way of working out the hierarchy. And they need that because they're training to be in groups with a hierarchy. And men have been doing this since the, the dawn of time. So, um, we join a, when we emancipate at grade 12, and we join a work crew, well, what's your job? Well, I got the shovel. Okay, and then there's the senior apprentice, and then there's the foreman, and then there's the boss boss, and we're all five, ten years apart, and everybody knows their place. Yeah. And this is, the nat this is like a natural order for things. This is how we mentor our young males into adulthood. They need that. But we don't have mentorship for boys. Where did all the men go? So my, my wish would be that all men first look after their own. Yeah, they have to do that. And then you take on at least one in one. Why? Because there isn't enough healthy men to go around. And so you need to be out there doing something. You can look after your own, then you do one more step, you help look after some others. And how do you do that? Well, you provide attachment. That could be a nephew, it could be a grandson, it could be a neighbor, neighbor's kid. Why? Because he doesn't have a dad around? Right? It could be your volunteer work that you do with, well, the organizations that I like are the ones that allow contact in a group over an entire year. Boy Scouts, cadets, martial arts, or judo, for instance, uh, because they have rankings and a hierarchy that they make the boys participate in. They get contact over the whole year with the same senseis, teachers. Right? They're part of a, I don't know if it's like Cut Scouts or Rangers or Cadets. Then they're part of a group that's uh, in a hierarchy. You, you join up, you learn, you become. There's small group leaders. I think when I was in Boy Scouts, we had sixers, which meant you were in charge of six kids. If you were the leader of a group of six, then your scoutmaster was your leader. And that's how it worked, right? You learned to do things in a group together, march together, or put up a tent together. Yeah. Um, I have the board game club, but it's organized in this wide range of ages. Yes, and yes, there's me kind of sponsoring the whole program and supervising it, but then I have hired staff who then are in training with me, and then they work with the ones lower. And then the high school kids who are doing the advanced role playing games are, in a sense, demonstrating how to be together in front of the littler kids who are there every week playing the or plump, or sorry, or monopoly. Or we have um, any ring, or like a wide range of things. But the key is how does it serve the country? And so my overall my solution is we need to get back to making sure we maintain those attachments with kids and we keep a hold of those kids. Um, uh, until they've had their, uh, we just maintain that attachment until they don't need us anymore. They'll let us know, right? The 
that's all they need is that attachment. Then their own rigid energy will come out and they will figure out how to learn fast. Why? Because they should be motivated. They're natural humans. Just get out of the way. We should be evolved to do this properly. Right? We just have to get out of the way. It shouldn't take as much work as we, we think it does. So that kind of brings me to the end of um, explaining where the whole cycle. So these healthy people grow up, they're mature, then they have kids, then they'll, they'll do the same. They'll learn that to be a parent is to stay attached to your kids over a long period of time. And that means regular contact every week over most of all the year. Sometimes that's difficult. I mean, if you're a traveling salesperson or the kind of, or if say your father's in the military, well, then you either move around with him or he's gone a lot. But when you come back, you need to make it up. Spend that, so you can, it's not easy to make it up, but you try to compensate for it with your time off. And so you need that regular contact. You've got to attach to your kids before they become peer oriented. Um, once the kids are peer oriented, it's difficult, but it can still be done. So, for instance, your kid is saying, you know, oh, I want to go with my friends, right? Well, we're having family dinner here. And that's a great ritual, family dinner. Um, we shouldn't give that one up too easily. Um, we're having a barbecue. Tell you what, you tell your friends to come over here, they're going to barbecue with us. Uh, but now the peer group is having to function within your own umbrella. So now that peer group has to work with you, the fact that the peer group itself is now at your house and you have some interaction with, you know, the other kids going, yes, Mr. Harvey, or no, sir. And, uh, come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> like, no, 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 barbecue's not over until 7.30, <laughs> then your kids can go up by seven. Right, you keep them around for a bit. So, yeah, I thought that would take me an hour. Question. Okay, so questions? Yes, I'm wondering, um, for people that didn't get the attachment and they have developmental issues, like even later in life, is there any way to rectify that for older people? Like, is there any way to, like, for adults, is it just like too late? Like, if they had developmental problems and obviously things are happening later in life that are, it's kind of, you know, no. they never fail to launch? It's not too late. Um, if you're attached, so for instance, uh, there's different attachment styles, and if your attachment style is the kind that doesn't, you might be, your attachment style, for instance, might be conflictually attached. Um, often I've seen couples where, yeah, they're conflictually attached, that's why they got together. Um, they, in a sense, argue and have fights all the time, but that's their way of getting close without too close. I mean, it's very intimate to be involved in a fight with somebody, an argument, mm -hmm. right? It's very intimate. And then some of them will joke that, some of them will joke like, oh yeah, we always argue and it's really intense and then, yeah, but the makeup sex is awesome, <laughs> right? And it's because they're drawn together in the intensity and then that then is quite in some ways intimate and it kind of, no, I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about violent couples, I'm talking about couples who, you know, have no problem disagreeing with their partner. Whereas I'd say with my spouse and I, we are conflict avoiders. <laughs> it's the opposite problem. So. Like we need to, on purpose, sometimes bring those things out just to stay healthy. Otherwise, we're avoiding problems for too long and it builds up. But check out your attachment style online. The attachment styles inventory test, attachment style test. And you will get all sorts of examples. Of, click on one of them, try their little test, take you 15 minutes, and you can get an attachment style. You can read about the attachment styles. You can read about the other attachment styles. Now, my hunch would be that when you meet somebody and their attachment style is totally not your attachment style, well, there's just no chemistry. That's what we would say is no chemistry. But if it is the same attachment style, um, then that might make it easier to hook up with them. There are other couple dynamics that play into why I think couples get together. And those things either match or don't match as well. But that's what we are referring to when we hook up with somebody and say, Oh yeah, we've got chemistry. We we somehow either poke each other's buttons the right way or the wrong way, but either way, there's there's energy here, right? And so that's why we can't stop thinking about the other person. Yeah, yeah. 
So yes, check it out. And then you're investing in yourself over time by learning about yourself, reflecting on that, talking with a partner as you grow and develop. Because, I mean, adulthood doesn't end at 18. It's not like you turn 18. Oh, yeah, I'm an adult. Great. I was a, I can't say that word on, on camera, but I wasn't that nice when I was 18. I was immature and probably uh, inconsiderate would be a nice way of saying it. Uh, but as I got older and more mature, then I changed. And um, I wasn't, every 10 years I became a slightly different person because I keep learning. So keep learning, keep working on yourself, work, use other people to get the feedback you need to find out what it is that is not working for the others. Because it's, we're, we're people and we're social animals. And, we have a mammalian brain that's been driving us for longer than we've had a prefrontal cortex. So that mammalian brain is is driving a lot of the emotional energy in groups, emotional energy in partnerships, and managing our emotional distance with each other is a huge skill. You get too close and the other person's like, oh, you're, you're too close, can't handle this. It was great when we were dating, but now we're living together, it's like, oh, too close. Well, if we had better skills, maybe we could handle it. Um, but that's our mammalian brains talking, how to manage that emotional distance, right? And um, I think in many ways we operate out of more of our feelings in that, in that sense. And then our thinking comes after the fact and we just make up stories to explain what it is we already did to rationalize it, right? Like, I don't think there was thinking going on when we originally came up with the behavior. And then we just try to explain it after the fact. So, I really do believe the hierarchy is actually the other way around. The reptilian and the cognitive. So, I think, I think the drivers are coming from below. From, it's much older. Why it is you even want to bond with another human being. But we are pair bonded species, so to not do that is kind of working against your own evolutionary history. Eventually, there is going to be a kind of a desire to pair bond. How do we teach our young ones to pair bond if they didn't have an attachment base when they were young? Well, you'll have to learn it later. What do you think about Montessori's learning styles? I don't know if you know about that. They're kind of like all these kids in different age groups teaching each other, so that would be kind of like a hierarchy. Isn't that, is that how it works, or? Well, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I, was thinking, I, they, I don't know if they have that for like older age groups, but usually for preschools and kindergartens, there's more Montessori learning styles. But yeah, I don't know if there's anything, as I was trying to think of some options, what people could do in the city to have their children in these hierarchies, if they recognize that they need to be looking for that. I guess there's Boy Scouts, cadets, um, but yeah, I'm not sure if there's even a, it'll be helpful just to get this information out, but like if there's things that we could do, like suggestions in the city, uh, do you have anything that you, that you think that we could do? Well, if you're talking about education, uh, I know there's a lot of Montessori preschools, mm -hmm. um, but the thing about daycare and preschools is that um, most parents collude with the idea of putting their kids in daycare because they're going to go out and work and they need more money. Um, the problem is that if we were to take somebody like Piaget, who would say that the socialization of a child starts at about grade, about age six, that's when a child actually needs to socialize, which is why we have kindergarten grade one starting when they do. It is not a need of the child to socialize them before that age. In fact, their needs are others. They have other needs before that age. So, the purpose of play dates when you have preschool kids is to make sure the adults stay healthy. It has nothing to do with the kids. Kids don't learn social skills. They can be trained to do certain behaviors, like share your toys. They can be trained to do that, but they don't feel altruistic. So you're saying that young children don't need to go to preschool, really? Like, and that they should be at home with their parents until they're... Like, well, if I was a betting kid. guy, and I'm not, but if I was to make a bet, I would say I would go with 100,000 years of human evolution that said 
know if the child's under six, they're with their mother or under her skirt, <laughs> right? Like, or when dad comes home, they're wrestling with dad, right? They're not, they're with their primary caregivers. And so I think, you know, that this reliance on the expectation that um, one of the messages we're giving young girls, and I have to raise a girl, uh, is that, oh, you will grow up, you will have a career and a family and a life, and it'll be balanced? I don't think so. It's not going to be balanced. Not if you want it all. I'm not sure you have enough hours in the day to do it all. If you want to be a mother or a father, uh, I think you have to look at it from the point of view of how to meet your child's needs. And if those needs are demanding that, you stay home that the child says, oh, I want my primary caregiver around all the time, because that's who I want to learn from. I want to learn my language from my primary caregiver, not from my daycare teacher. So that's difficult. I'm not sure how to do that, because I think that men and women are doing the best they can to come up as teens, and they, they work out some sort of system. You know, I'll take my mat leave and look after the kids and then, oh, if your workplace gives you a mat leave, I wish men got more of a mat leave, but then they'd be primary caregiver for a while. And that would bond the dads with the kids. Can men be the primary caregiver then? Absolutely. Like, so it doesn't matter if it's mother or father staying home with the kid for yeah. the six years? No, the important thing is the attachment needs are met. Yeah. You figure out how to get that job done. Can, it, can they take turns? Like, can it be two primary caregivers? Yes. Or can that be one person? Yes, humans have been involved to grow up with parents. We're, we're a pair bonded species, that should be natural. So if somebody says to do something other than what we've done for 100,000 years, show me the evidence. <laughs> and that's, that would be, so what do you feed children? Well, what do children eat for 100,000 years? Our system is designed to eat that. Does it come in a little box and a piece of plastic? No. You know, where's the mashed carbohydrate? <laughs> where's the little bits of meat fiber that you put in their mouth and let them get wrapped around their tooth? The one tooth they've got. I mean, I think we have to think more about what we were designed to do and then try to follow that closer. And each parent has to figure out how they are going to pass on to the next generation their culture and beliefs and knowledge, right? And you can't do that. You can't pass your culture on to your kid if the kid is being looked after by the government. And I don't think we're looking at that clearly anymore. And so what's happened is in order to come up with a culture, I think I'm just, now this is my conjecture, but I think that literally the government has tried to figure out what kind of culture do we need to spend to send to little kids. And so we've come up with these philosophies. And they come out as, oh, we're all special, we're all... And, you know, they're just little things, but when you add them all together, it becomes almost like a culture. And, and yet, I'm not sure it's always the same message that we'd want to... If we thought in our heart of hearts, in our own home, what do we want for, what do I want for my child? Well, now I'm going to get selfish about what's in here and here and what I want to put into my child. And I want to be a bit more protective about what I let them, I can use them as a thing, put into my child. Now, if I let them have my child for the majority of their childhood, what was I expecting going to happen? If I want my child to get what's in here and have my heart, and they have mine, um, then I need to be with them. And so we need to organize all of our, all of the different social factors that come into a child's life, whether it be how we're married, how we divorce, how we work out child custody, how we work out um, 
and their education, their socialization, their athletic development, their, their physical development, their everything, even how we eat is important in the sense that if we're picking up a pizza and, and snarking it back in front of Netflix as soon as we get home, there's no family meal. But it was the family meal when you actually had time to get quizzed by your parents with how did your how did your writing assignment go that you handed into your teacher yesterday? Right? What how's that conversation gonna go? Why is it you were fighting with your best friend? I heard you were fighting with your best friend. Who told you that? Your brother. Right? So without those conversations, how do you stay involved with your children? How does it serve attachment? So I think we need to change our focus from well, learning content as being an important thing. Or thinking that it's really important to give a five-year-old an iPad because, wow, computers are all the rage these years. We're going to get a kid used to a screen time, right? <laughs> We're colluding. Uh, my own mother referred to, in the days when all of our electronics were coming from Japan, um, I remember her on the phone. And uh, she's saying, oh no, they're, they're, the kids are fine right now. They're, they're with the Japanese babies here. Because <laughs> they're watching some TV. You know, it was, but it was really on three channels. So if it was that half hour that our show was on, we would sit in front of the TV and watch that show when it was over. We didn't want to see the news. That was the next thing. So we'd run out and play because it was over, right? But now you can just stay in front of the TV and flip channels. So with Netflix, you can actually drive the drive it yourself. So we we now collude with that in, in too, far too big a way. More questions? So what you said about uh, uh, when you go into government schools, which is pretty unavoidable, I guess, nowadays, and being with kids the same age, like what would you say the best ways are to to remedy that with social media too, I guess, like just have no screen time? How would you get them to interact with kids of all ages? Well, I'd say in my own, with my own daughter, um, her mother and I had similar views. Um, and so the TV that she had at her mom's house, I didn't have a TV. The TV at her mom's house had the rabbit ears for three channels and one of them was crunch. So that's the only screen time she could get. As far as when she wanted a cell phone, when she got older, um, great, you want a cell phone? Great. How much are they anyways? Well, I don't know, $100? Wow. How are you going to get $100? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't give them a cell phone. The point is, you don't have to give them a cell phone. Oh, well, if they had a cell phone, then I could call them if they were out all the time. Okay, now you're colluding with independence again. It's not independence you want. Oh no, you have to come home and check in with me. Well, but if I had a cell phone, I could just phone you. Know, do you have a cell phone? No, but you can. Come on, man. You're going to have to come home and check in. We're going to have family dinner, then you can go back up. Yes, yeah, so I have to be there for family dinner. Family dinner is a wonderful ritual. Great chance to try to be healthy. We're already so rushed, and fast food is always so easy to get especially in the city, but family day. Then we should take our time and deep breath and relax and, and, um, and have that family time together. Cook the food together. Get the food on your fingers. It's ancient. It should be good for us. Yeah. So you're saying since we can't necessarily control what happens in the government school when they get there, you have to take advantage of what you can control at home, which is That's obviously right. the more important and, thing. And with respect to, on the one hand, we have some parents who are, in a sense, too busy, and it leads to borderline neglect. And certainly not using the task for the child, and the children will become denied. And on the other hand, we have helicopter parents who program every single bit of time for the child, and in a sense, indoctrinate the child with the belief that there's a right way to do everything. And so it almost shuts down creativity because they want to know the right way to do it before they do it. And the helicopter child children are constantly 
yes, the parent is there all the time and the attachment needs are being met, but you, the idea is to meet the attachment needs and then free range the kids. So there's a wonderful, um, I think I've got a name down here. She has this book called Free Range Kids and a website. She got in trouble when she allowed her, uh, got into the papers in the States and stuff. She got in trouble when her, uh, she let her kids walk to the parking lot. Uh, Lenore Eskenazi, freerangekids.com. And you can, you can check that out. But the idea being is you meet the attachment needs so the child has everything they need in here and the emergent energy comes out and they are gonna wanna play, explore, be creative and learn that, that energy, just trust it. As soon as they're ah, I'm too far from home, they'll come running back. Why? Because they're gonna to return to their attachments. Instead of running to their peers, they'll come back to you. And not to collude with that when they go that risky time, grade five, six, seven, and that's when you're gonna lose them to the peers. So keep them close. Mm -hmm. I know Carl, you've got kids about that age? Yep. Yeah, keep them close. Try to, and if you're competing with their friends, invite the friends to come with you and you take them to the zoo, the park, the pool. But they travel with you as a, as a group. Invite the other kids. So then the other kids actually get access to another parent. It's, it's not just the peer group being sent out with $10 spending money to go to the mall. Yeah, so it's better to socialize when, when you're present as a parent. Rather than preschool, yeah. you're socializing them with their peers. <laughs> yeah. Is there any positive context for peer groups, like if, when the children get older, like in high school and in university? Well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea was that as you uh, historically, the idea was that as you age up out of being a child, then your peers become your future allies in the adult world. Yeah? So, but you don't need them yet that way, right? And that, we're, we're definitely supplying enough of that already. That's not very to worry about. They're getting plenty of peer contact. And we're overdoing that one. Because it suits us to efficiently deliver the education system, the education content, to same age peers, that they're all equally ignorant. But when you've got a peer group that's leading each other, you've got the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. They can't mature themselves. Yeah, it makes sense. Whereas you put a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old and an 8-year-old on the same board game, and the 8-year-old farts, and the 11-year-old starts <laughs> giggling, the 14-year-old turns and goes and cues up the 11-year-old that maybe that shouldn't be so funny and it cues up the 8-year-old that maybe you shouldn't fart in front of some other people. Okay, but if it's in the same age peers, they all laugh. But so nobody learns anything. They don't learn there's a social thing around that about expelling body odors. Which I guess is why there's sports and that is so important, right? Like you wouldn't keep someone at the same belt just because they were the same age. You promote the one who is getting better, right? Oh, absolutely. Regardless of how old they are. Absolutely. Their peers. Yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. And with the increase in their rank comes the increase in responsibility. And that I do not hold back on. That you are responsible. So if I have a, a child to, let's say, runs into another child. Hey, this is judo, eyes open, right? He ran into me. How come you didn't see him coming? <laughs> right? Okay, now you heard him, you look after him, right? Well, what do I do? Well, you, he's crying, you sit with him, right? Okay, so he sits down and he's still crying. He's still crying, you just gotta stay sitting there. You heard him, you look after him. Take responsibility for what he did. Well, what does he teach? I don't know, ask him. <laughs> okay, well, just sit with him. He's not alone. Right? And you didn't tell him you didn't. Did you do it on purpose? No. Well, you should tell him that. 
Well, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. Okay. Well, then the tears will stop and we get back to playing again. We restore the relationship, right? So responsibility is absolutely key to that. that. Yeah, it's not more rank because you want the power to force other people to do what you yeah. say. No, 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 no. Every time you go up the social ladder, you 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 gain more responsibilities. Oh, it's actually more work. And in fact, it, that's why um, the biggest, toughest guy isn't necessarily the one that's going to make it to the top. The one that's going to make it to the top is maybe more smarter and knows how to socially organize allies so that there's a group that's backing them to be going up. Because we're, we're, we're social creatures and this is much more complex than just, well,